Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lenore von Stein, and this is The Facts. Uh, this is a discussion episode of The Facts, and The Facts has music and discussion. And tonight we're talking about, this is the second part of a two-part discussion on the effects of rape. Uh, and I'm sitting here tonight with Meredith Weber, who's um, uh, a clinical, I'm, I'm going to make sure I say this right, uh, clinical uh, assistant professor of school psychology, right, uh, at Temple University, uh, and um, a trauma therapist. Um, Esther Deblinger, who's a professor of psychiatry at, um, at Rowan. Yes. <laughs> I can't read my own words. And, uh, and also the co-chair of CARES, Child Abuse Research, uh, Education and Services. Uh, and Erin Gallagher, who is uh, an investigator for Physicians for Human Rights. For, yes, I said it right. And, um, and she's, working with, she's worked with, um, with adult victims of uh, sexual assault in conflict zones. And these two ladies work mostly with children. And you work with um, children and adults, right? And during the break, we started to talk about uh, institutions and institutional acceptance of uh, certain um, uh, sexual uh, assaults, uh, uh, acceptance in the terms of, in the sense of not doing anything about them. You know, this has been true in the military and the Catholic Church and the, uh, on many college campuses, in many schools, uh, certainly in the prison system. Um, and, and the uh, one thing that strikes me is that this, you know, if you're looking for kind of what's the, if, if you're going to draw a picture of what's the kind of situation where rape is going to be, you know, you're likely to have more rape, uh, is this kind of authoritative uh, hidden kind of world where certain people have a lot of power and that's it, my way or the highway. Um, so, well, anybody got anything to say about that? And what, 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 how do you handle institutional, um, you know, when, when you're in it or when you're, I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, I, I can't imagine how prisoners handle it, you know. I think it's important to hold institutions responsible when they look away. Because I, I think people look away from sexual assault when they're protecting the institution instead of protecting the individual who's being harmed. And one of the, the commonalities of all of these different institutions is that um, they've had such immunity and there has been no oversight. They have been allowed to, they have their own laws, their, their own rules. Um, their own management and the outside world has been very much at a distance um, but but obviously we, we can't be so because otherwise it's 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 created an environment where it's allowed to happen and then it's been covered up um, so there, there needs to be some sort of oversight from the outside since they haven't been able to manage it internally does this mean that sexual assault is part of situations where there isn't vigilance against sexual assault where it isn't uh, where, where you know where it's it's that this uh, that this is somehow part of the what people do with each other some portion of the population does with each other given their druthers you give them you give them enough power and a certain portion of the population is going to do this to other human beings or or is, is that just too abstract well, it seems like a lack of oversight is dangerous across the board I mean you just had a situation in Pennsylvania where two judges were uh, taking bribes to send these children to a facility where they were getting kickbacks. Yes, yes. And it went on for years, um, you know, because they were judges and seemingly had little oversight. So, you know, we can look at the banking industry. I mean, there's a lot of examples of just lack of oversight being problematic, I think, behaviorally. Lack of oversight and also secrecy and, and silence, um, isolated communities. Um, I, I think that we do need to encourage open dialogue about issues that concern children and, and women um, being oppressed. And um, I think when there is an environment of openness, it's less likely to occur. Well, I think also what you said about there being consequences that are visible to everyone is very important. I live in Pennsylvania, and I can say that after the Penn State sex abuse scandal happened, there has been change. 
uh, on college campuses, there's much, much more education and awareness around mm -hmm. Yep. not only sexual assault, but you know, what does this look like in situations where maybe children from the community are coming on campus? Uh, child abuse reporting is up after that incident. So I, I do mm -hmm. think in that case, you know, the fines were pretty significant and there were other penalties to the college and it did make an impact. One of the other things we talked about just we, we, talk, we talked about briefly was the difference, the culture and cultural attitudes towards women towards children, mm -hmm. uh, towards, towards the power structure in general, who's the, you know, who's the top of the chain, uh, and, uh, and the effects of sexual assault, the, the, maybe, the, maybe the amount of, but also the effects of, of so if, you're, if, if, if the culture is very um, mm, torn up about sex, like the Catholic Church, or uh, many very um, fundamentalist, more fundamentalist um, situations, that the that the that the the amount of sexual assault, perhaps we don't know, we don't have the stats on this, whether the amount of sexual assaults in those situations is greater or less, but certain, but is is the effect of those because the the effect on the victim i'm 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 a bad person i'm really basically a really bad person or this wouldn't have happened to me mm -hmm. rather than i'm not you know i i wrong place wrong time or you know bad luck or whatever it is as opposed to bad person itis yeah i think it seems even whether it's domestically in the us or internationally almost it's almost universal that victims feel that they, they feel shame with it. And in certain cultures, they're going to feel much more so. Um, but that somehow they were to blame or they played some sort of role, I think especially more so sexual abuse versus sexual assaults, but that they, they played a, a role in it or had somehow they, they continue to blame themselves, even when it's the most blatant, violent acts that we've seen still that victim takes on some of that burden and that's such a I think societal you know cultural um, issue and even we see you know here we are in 2014 you think we, we've watched the news and how many cases have we seen just in the last year where we've been putting the blame on a victim still um, some of the cases in the Midwest I, I don't remember specifically all of them, but I've been surprised we've heard judges put the blame on the victims or where you re see virally in the, in the internet, you know, why the victim did this, why was she, still once again, why was she wearing this, why was she there at that time of night, and internally, I mean, a victim internalizes this still. Is that, is that one of the, uh, among the, aside from the cultural modality, is that one of the things that people do some of the time is, is that they take they take ownership of whatever happened to them in a way to own it, you know, and it it it, it back it, it it bucks them, um, uh, because I I I I'm controlling the volume in the picture here, um, and um, so I ergo I was responsible for that, and that's I I, I found myself doing that sometimes, uh, it, it, but it has it has really scurrilous effects, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And I, I think offenders reinforce those messages. Mm. They will tell children, they will tell adult victims as well that they're responsible for their own assault. Um, and it is, it is a, a very serious problem when children carry those messages with them long after the abuse has ended um, because it causes such endless suffering when you believe that you've done something to bring on such horrible treatment you begin to accept that kind of treatment in, in your life and other relationships. So it is very important for children to overcome those ideas that they might have about what led to the abuse and uh, the damage that it might have caused because there is a great deal of, of hope. Children can overcome these experiences. Adults can as well. I, 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 I saw this heart-rendering scene, or a song about it, on the street. There was a little boy, he must have been about three years old, and he was with uh, a, a person who was a babysitter, and he was crying in this incredible way. He says, I'm wrecking the whole world. He really felt this in a way that was so, uh, um, I'm, I'm, and, and the only other person who stopped there 
I didn't, um, was somebody to, you know, stop talking, you know, you're giving your babysitter a hard time. It was, what a nightmare this was, you know, the, 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 him accepting the responsibility. Somebody must have told him he did something mm -hmm. really bad, you know, and he's, 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 he, and he doesn't know what to do about yeah, this. Absolutely. He doesn't know how to fix it you know he's he's i'm just you know it's it's in me i'm i'm bad mm -hmm. i can't you know that must be something akin to what rape victims feel absolutely when adults tell children these these things that they are responsible that they are bad children do accept them when they hear them from the adults that are the most important people in their lives especially when they're parents um and unfortunately i think it does stay with kids if they don't get the help they need um, if they don't see healthier relationships. And if I could just jump in on, it, on the on the international side, certainly when, when girls and of, of particular cultures, and I'll use the example of, of Muslim culture in, in Libya and Syria ex um, specifically, where they are, their role in society is very much, at least as a girl, is, is being a virgin before she gets married. Um, marriage, virginity, uh, sexuality are all met, are all tied up together. So if she's raped before she gets married, it's, she feels that her life is over with. She will never marry. No one will ever marry her. Um, she, the family might disown her. They might kill her. Or as we saw a number of times, she kills herself with feeling that she has brought dishonor not not so much to herself, but to the family or even to the, to the village. So what an immense societal shame that is placed on a young person with no outlet um, for it. I remember the, the stories in the Middle Ages where there's a very famous female painter who was raped and the only, the only way to solve the problem for her to get her, her, um, her honor back was to marry the rapist and that was a standard procedure and that's probably still the standard procedure in, in some parts in of the world some of the conservative areas yeah so it's 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 tied up not only with attitudes about sex but also with attitudes about women about women one of the things we said before off camera is you talked about that she loses her virginity but no man can ever lose their virginity i mean they're just basically not virgins forever or they they lose their virginity hallelujah uh uh it's it's and, and, and that hasn't moved much. It's moved some. But I think that what you're talking about really adds to the difficulty of men disclosing abuse too, because I think they have to, you know, there's a societal message that this is a badge of honor. And if they don't feel like that, I think it can be one more barrier to reporting it, because it certainly happens to boys and men too. Yes, yes. There's been some really some heart rendering uh, people talking, you know, uh, in the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, issues, you know, about how they felt boys, young boys, choir boys and stuff about, because they seem to be often the object uh, about how they carried this with them and mm -hmm. how this messed with them. Mm -hmm. And some of them that told, but because it was a priest um, or a priest who was friends with the family, they, or let's say it was a police department that oftentimes was very Irish or, <laughs> or Catholic, I should say, um, um, centered organization, um, they were not believed. So not only maybe the few that did have the courage to tell then were, were not believed, um, so sort of a, a second layer of betrayal, not believed by their family, um, who may have introduced the priest to the, to the, to the altar boy, as an example. Why wouldn't they be believed? Because it's, because it's, why? You know, I mean, it's not unbelievable. Well, people, people do think of someone who would sexually abuse a child as being extremely strange. They don't imagine that it would be someone who they look up to, like a priest. Mm -hmm. So it is, difficult, it is difficult to imagine. These are crimes that happen behind closed doors, in secret. You don't see them. So when you're told that someone has done something as heinous as sexually abusing a child, you're imagining a stranger usually. You're imagining someone lurking behind a, you know, in a dark alley. You're not imagining the teacher who you respect or the coach who everyone loves. You're not certainly imagining the priest who is, you know, there on every Sunday and um, others respect him. Mm -hmm. So it, it is often difficult for 
people to believe. That is why the education is so important. So how do you how do you help people overcome these layers of layers of issues of you know how do you do that? Well, I think just to continue with the theme of parents. I mean, the other thing about believing is that it opens up a great amount of emotional pain, not only in what you believe about yourself as a parent and being able to protect your child, but your worldview. Uh, you know, if you can't trust these people, who can you trust? So I know in, in terms of working with parents after this happens, part of the work is also uncovering the meaning they've made out of this for themselves and then helping bold, build them back up as a parent, telling them that they're not a bad parent because this happened and normalizing that it is all too common and there is not a, a way to tell necessarily. Yeah. But I think it is what, one of the things that we're doing right here is just educating the public so that people do understand that these are not strangers. They are not lurking in dark alleys. They unfortunately are around our children every day. And we need to keep an open conversation with our children. It has to start with very young children. We, you know, in the media, we're talking more about child sexual abuse. Adults are talking more about child sexual abuse. But I don't think we're talking yet enough with children. Mm -hmm. And sadly, the most common way that child sexual abuse comes to light is with a children telling, with a, with a child telling. We can't rely on children to stop child sexual abuse, but we do have to acknowledge that the single most common way we learn about sexual abuse is from a child telling. And so we need to talk to children about it. What are some of the symptoms that teachers can see when they're dealing with a child uh, that the child is, is struggling, perhaps, with abuse of some sort? I mean, I, I, I have taught children, and I remember seeing this wondering, in a couple of cases, uh, what, the, what this girl had gone through because of the way that she talked about herself, because of the... Of the her inability to focus uh, and uh, that, oh, this kid has problems, problems in how she thinks about herself. What gave her those problems? You know, I mean, this is, so there are, there are guidelines that teachers have, right, to, to look at how children are behaving in the classroom, that, aside from looking and see if they have a mark on them or something. Yeah. Un unfortunately, there are no obvious signs Occasionally in a very young child, if you see an adult-like sexual behavior that they may engage in, then it is reasonable to suspect that sexual abuse might, might have occurred. But even then, it could be that they were exposed to pornography on the internet, or they were accidentally exposed to adult sexual activity in their, in their home. So it needs to be investigated. Um, but what you're describing is a child who's under some sort of stress, and it's worth inquiring so that that child has an opportunity to tell what's going on in her life. It may not be sexual abuse, mm -hmm. um, but it may be some other kind of difficulty or trauma. Yeah, and in talking about children, relationships are an enormous protective factor for them, both within their family and without. So the, the better a relationship is in a classroom or with a coach or with an outside mentor, the, the better it will be for the child, both in detecting if there may be something wrong and in their, in their recovery, too, in terms of support. I think about all these, all these people in war zones, all these kids growing up, all these, you know, this, this huge swath of human beings that are living with this trauma, passing it on to their children in some form or another, and wow. Uh, no, it's, I, 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 sometimes I think of it like if you could imagine in your own family if your, your daughter or your sister or your mother had been raped, what that does to the family, how it affects the family, and in, in a, in at least in the conflict area, we're generally talking about many victims. So it's your family, it's your neighbor and their family and their neighbor and your storekeeper and your doctor, and you end up having a village that is wounded, is damaged, and that makes it for a, a larger community. And I think just like an individual, you, have a, you can have a very damaged, harmed community as much as the individual, and it takes a while for, for the whole community to recover. And it, and, it, and it won't until the individuals can recover. So the recovery is, is, uh, has to do with 
among other things, with talking about it, with feeling free enough to talk about it. Uh, is there any other parts of this? Well, I think it's very, very important to learn how to cope with the anxiety that is raised by fearing people. You know, when you're sexually assaulted, oftentimes your um, experience with others is damaged because you're fearful that someone else may betray you, someone else may harm you. And so it's very important to have healing relationships, to have opportunities for healthy relationships. I think it's also important to kind of, you know, think of some of the symptoms we're talking about as survival skills. They emerged because they may have helped someone survive. So when you have a situation where somebody might kind of escape into their mind or escape into fantasy, because what's going on in real time is so awful, however, that can look like dissociation or that can look like they're just kind of not mm -hmm. present afterwards. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it, too, I think is kind of working with them to see what's fueling these behaviors and then helping them learn um, you know, something that's going to be more adaptive in that setting. But uh, this work really does need to be one-on-one, -on -one, right? I mean, there are an awful lot of victims and not an awful lot of psychologists. Uh, that's true. We, we do do, though, work individually and in groups. And I have to say, with children, it's incredibly heartwarming to see children meet other children mm -hmm. who've been through a similar experience. It's a very concrete way of showing a child that there's nothing wrong with them. And sharing with them that there's another child who's as nice as you are, who you're able to meet, who mm -hmm. had a very similar experience. So group therapy can be very, very healing as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that stands out when I um, worked at CARES with Esther is that I remember a parent saying to me once, because we only saw abuse victims, said all the children in the, in the waiting room just seemed like normal kids. They were all playing, but I knew why they were all here. But that's the point. They're normal kids, and they were playing, and they looked like normal kids, and they liked the same things other kids did. So I think that was very heartening, too, yes, just the, the kindredness. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if something that we didn't get to, how, why, how is it, why is it so hard to get, to get um, you know, not that this is, you know, a kind of a pithy question because it seems sort of obvious in some way. Get to, to investigate these crimes, to to you know behind closed door crimes, to to you know, and how could that be made easier? Yeah, I did want to point out sort of the other other side of it is is um, is holding those responsible that have committed these crimes. So it is the the investigations and the prosecutions and convictions of 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 whether it's pedophiles or it's, or it's rapists in war. Um, so that's an important part of justice and healing is to know that these people, you know, that they've been, you've been validated for what's happened and they've been publicly um, convicted um, for what they've done. Um, but yeah, it, it goes back to, I mean, partly it's just a, a discomfort with, I think, anything sexual. Um, it's much easier to do these other cases where it's less emotional, um, it's less intimate. The once it, it be, these crimes happen often in private, so you don't have the many witnesses. You maybe don't have all the physical evidence that you have with a murder, with bullets and and weapons and blood, etc. You maybe have some, but oftentimes not as much. Um, the, the fear of the victims, reluctance of victims to, to come forward and to report, um, to stay as part of the process. And I think in many societies, and also including ours, a less of a priority that's been put on these cases. Um, you have prosecutors and detectives that feel more comfortable going after the murders and the burglaries than they do sexual assault and, and sexual child abuse. So there's a number of different factors that play in to not wanting to do these cases, for putting them at lower priority, to more difficult finding the evidence, more difficult bringing victims in to testify, um, and prosecutors, investigators will pick what they think are easier cases, and also ones where they think they believe sexual violence cases, you need more specialized training. Mm -hmm. Uh, which most people don't have, so they see it all as just too difficult. There has been a movement in this country, though, called the Child Advocacy Centers that have focused more on prosecuting child sexual abuse. And as you said, it is very, very difficult. 
But I think we've made some progress over the years. We, and we certainly have made progress in terms of um, pro providing effective therapies and some progress in terms of prevention efforts, educating children, educating adults, educating parents. We've got a little less than two minutes. Can you just very quickly tell us something about the prevention, something about prevention? I think uh, we talked about before having parents feel comfortable with their children talking to them about some of these things. So it's kind of the first thing is teaching parents that it's okay for their children to know the correct names for body parts and getting them comfortable with having those kind of conversations with their children early on so that if something does happen, it's already, you know, it's not the first time they've, they've used that word or they've had to think about it. Uh-huh. Seems like a good idea. And it's probably better to talk about it as education as opposed to prevention because we don't really have a way to 100% prevent child sexual abuse. But just the education, the open discussion, simply teaching children about okay and not okay touch is very important. At our clinic, 40% of the kids we see for suspected child sexual abuse are six and under. So we have to start this open discussion, this education very, very young with children. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stop this conversation. Um, so thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Esther. Uh, thank you, Erin. And um, I guess that's, uh, so this is the facts. And, and um, I hope you learned from this. I've learned from this. Um, and um, we've got, uh, I'm always, I'm really bad with this. We've got 10 seconds. Uh, so, da 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 da, -da <laughs> you know. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I uh, again, I, I hope we see you again on the facts. Bye.